three sons. And when he died, he left them 17 camels. So to the first son, he left half of the camels. To the second son, he left a third of the camels. And to the third son, he left one ninth of the camels. Now, unfortunately, even though the king, the king was a fairly wise man, um, 17 doesn't really divide out evenly. So his three sons were stuck. They were a little unsure what to do. So they went to a wise old woman and they asked for her advice who lived down the, the donkey path. And, and so she sat there and thought about it and said, let me get back to you tomorrow. I don't really know what to do here yet. So she thought about it. And the next day the boys came back and um, she said, listen, I'm not, a, you know, I, the only solution I can come up with is I have this camel over here. And if you'd like it, you're welcome to it. Um, and so now that they had 18 camels, um, they had a way of trying to sort this out. So the first son got his half of 18, which was nine. The second son got his third of 18, which was six. And the third son got his ninth of 18, which was two. So if you add nine to six, you get 15 plus two is 17. And they said, wow, great. And they gave the wise old woman her camel back. So why do I share this? Well, I share this because when we look at negotiation problems, we often think that's not solvable. Someone's gonna win, someone's gonna lose. We can't get there, it's not gonna work. And what I usually say to folks is, I want you to keep the, the story of the 18th camel in mind when you have that idea in your head. Because the reality is actually that with creativity, with thinking about how do I rearrange what's in front of me? How do I add, how do I subtract? How do I think differently? about the problem, you can solve it. I will tell you, I have seen unbelievable solutions to really difficult negotiation problems because people said, there's gotta be a solution. We just haven't found it yet. So, you know, it's interesting. There's a guy named Lakdar Brahimi, who's a famous UN mediator from Algeria. And, he, and the program on negotiation, where I've been affiliated for a long time, gives out a great negotiator award every year. And he, he won it. And we usually bring these guys and they come and talk about, you know, their, their secrets of their success, if you will. And he said something that, that always stuck with me. Um, he said, in order to be a, a great negotiator, if you will, you have, to have an, you have to have humility. However, you also have to have the belief that you can solve problems that nobody else has. So it's a fine line, right? It's, it's realizing that you have to be humble and you have to be um, you know, not overly confident about your ability, but you also have to think that the possible is, the impossible is possible. And so, um, so that's in part what this step is all about, because as I said, negotiation requires creativity. And in part, what I'm asking you to do is to step away kind of temporarily from the decision-making role, okay? So when we go into a negotiation, we have our, our hat on, whatever hat we're wearing the, of the organization we represent. When you wear that hat, it's hard to be creative. So in part, what I'm asking you to do is take the hat off and put it aside for a minute and say to the other person you're negotiating with, look, so we've, now we have a pretty clear understanding of what's important to us here. Let's put up a whiteboard, let's get a computer screen, and let's just start thinking together about what are the possibilities. Um, and per usual, in general, in life, you know, the more options you have, the more likelihood that one of those things is going to be um, acceptable to both, et cetera. But one of the really important pieces to this is that, and there's a lot of research that supports this, that when you um, create options with the other in a joint manner, you are far more likely to actually implement um, what you've created because you handed, had a hand in the process as opposed to somebody sort of just walking in and dropping something in your lap, if you will, and saying, here's the, here's the best way forward. Now, this requires a little bit of setup to do this because people, I can tell you right now, if you suggest this to people, some people might say, okay. A lot of people will be like, what the hell are you doing? Like, what, is, what trick are you trying to pull, right? So it requires a little bit of setting up. So the first thing is, what are the ground rules that you want to lay out? So you want to say, look, I don't, want to buy, I don't want anybody to make an offer here. Like, I'm not offering anything. I don't want you to make an offer. What I want us to do is start putting things up on a board somewhere. So we're not making decisions, we're just creating, okay? And of course you wanna review the interest, like any options gotta go back and connect to the interest you just uncovered, right? 
Um, but then there's also, um, you know, there are a lot of people who feel like brainstorming is kind of a tired concept. And I would just say from my own experience that maybe, um, but it works really well for me. Um, and there's sort of some new twists to brainstorming that have been put out there. Um, but in one sense, your goal with this kind of a process is not to just say, well, you could do it or I could do it or we could split the difference. There's nothing creative about that, right? What we want are creative and wild ideas. We want people to be thinking blue sky, um, right? And um, there's, a, there's an approach. So apparently the folks at Apple got a little bit of tile, tired of brainstorming because there are some bad ideas out there. I mean, you know, it's just the truth. And so at, what they did at Apple is they started brainstorming, but if somebody had an idea and people thought it was really not realistic, they would do something called plussing, which is that they would basically um, have to um, take that idea and make it more acceptable um, so that they weren't throwing the idea completely aside, but they were adding something to it that would be valuable. So you can use brain, some kind of brainstorming. I, uh, you know, one of the things I love as, as a consultant when I go to organizations is I kind of take what I would call a naive perspective because I don't know their world I don't know the world that I'm entering the way they do. So I'll challenge a lot of assumptions. I'll ask a lot of questions like, well, why isn't that possible? And, you know, I was doing this a couple of weeks ago. And so he's like, huh, I just assumed it was. And I said, well, why'd you do that? And they said, because in the past, um, we made that assumption. And I said, well, maybe we should, you know, times have changed. Like maybe we should re-examine that. And so when you take a sort of a consultant's naive perspective, you question assumptions that people are making about why something isn't possible, why something isn't doable. Okay, I don't, I don't. To be perfectly frank, I don't care how cre how you get creative. I just want you to get creative and not let the process just speed on by because you will miss an opportunity. So here's just as an example. This is why option generation doesn't happen. Okay, so usually when a negotiation problem or challenge comes up. Um, I sit in my office, you sit in yours, I come up with a solution, you come up with your solution, we get together and I say, ah, I have a great way forward. And you say, oh, well, that's not a bad way forward, but I have a better way forward. And so what happens is either we come up with some weird compromise or we disagree. And the biggest problem with this way of doing things is my ego, whether I want to admit it or not, gets tied to my proposal, my way of doing. And so if you reject my idea and you say, oh, mine's better, then you're rejecting me. Like that's kind of what people do when it comes to these processes. So, you know, pick, take the brainstorming approach. Instead of doing that, you get together, you can do it virtually. There's all kinds of ways of, of engaging, but basically together you're coming up with a number of different options and trying to figure out what makes the most sense. So that's one way. Another idea, I'm gonna give you a couple. <clears throat> of ways that you can go about getting creative. So the first one is just brainstorming is just stripping everything away and saying, Hey, let's just, um, you know, throw things up against the wall and see what sticks. The second, and, and I use this particularly uh, frequently when I'm talking about when we're negotiating around budgets is to try to unpack a problem. So in other words, when we look at a budget, we're usually thinking about it from a singular point of view. Um, and when you unpack a problem, you're able to kind of break it down as to, into its component parts and then sort of build a multi-issue negotiation out of what like a single issue that looks like you would get stuck around might happen. And so that enables you to identify multiple issues to perhaps make some trade-offs in all of this. So basically think, if I've got an issue that I'm trying to deal with, can I break it into its component parts? Okay. And then the last one, this is from <clears throat> the book Getting TS as well, is something that's called the circle chart. And this is a great tool to use when you're negotiating with a group or a team or something like that. You can, of course, use it with another person, but it's really helpful when you're doing this um, with a, a group of people to make sure that you're all on the same page. So step one in the bottom left corner of your circle is problem identification. What is wrong? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Are we clear? And it's interesting, you know, a lot of times when I mediate between people, I start by saying, can you tell me what the problem is from your perspective? And then I'll ask the same question to the other person. Um, and, and 
the reason I do that is because it's not infrequent that people are actually thinking about the problem differently. So I want to start by trying to get us on the same page with what's the problem and let's be clear about that, right? Then the second piece of this is analysis. So why is this problem happening? What's the reason for the problem? This also will pinpoint um, when people have a different perspective on it. Somebody might say, well, it's the relationship, like we don't work well together. And the other person might say, actually, it's, you know, the metrics that I'm gauged by, like I'm judged in this way and you're judged in that way. And I think that's why we're struggling, right? So we can get these different analytical points of view that help us. Hopefully they won't say it's because of you and you're an idiot because that kind of stops the conversation. Um, but nonetheless, important to analyze what's going on. Step three is, well, what options do we have? What approaches do we have for dealing with this kind of in theory in, in broad terms? But what I really like about this model is the last piece, which is the fourth quadrant is basically actionable ideas. So if we land on an option that works in step three that we think addresses the problem, then what are you going to do to advance this? And what am I going to do? What are our responsibilities here? And, and then you can do a check and say, if we did these things, will this indeed address the negotiation problem that we have? Okay. So, as I said, it's a nice tool to be able to kind of figure out together and, and be, make sure that you're on the same page when you're thinking through options. <clears throat> now, let me just give you a couple of questions that you can ask because um, when you are starting this process off, if you're going to do some brainstorming, um, you know, there are some simple questions to kind of get people going. So hypotheticals are always good um, in my mind because A, they're not real and B, they get people thinking differently, right? So what if we were to do this? And if somebody said, well, we couldn't do that because of X, Y, and Z. Well, now we have an insight into why we couldn't do that. So then you say, well, okay, if we can't do it because of X, Y, and Z, how do we address X, Y, and Z? Right? So that's a good thing. Or um, under what circumstances could you agree? So what you're basically saying to them is, tell me the blockages that we would have to get out of the way for you to be able to agree to this. Um, one of my new favorite sayings that I learned about a year ago is, I have a very clear understanding of why you can't do all of these things, but I don't know why you can. So could you tell me why you can? Because it's a very different conversation. You know, people are really good at saying, no, 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 I can't do that. I can't do that. I get it. Tell me, you know, what would it take to say yes, basically? Um, and then, of course, you can ask for it, it, their advice. So what ideas do you have to solve the problem? People, like, like everybody else, love to be asked for their advice. Um, and so good to say to somebody, you know, I, assuming like you, you thought about this, um, or like me, you've been thinking about this, you, you have some ideas that might get us started. Right? Um, now, if you struggle, uh, look to external precedents. So, uh, or external, we, sometimes we call them objective criteria. But if you have a, a negotiation problem or a challenge, and let's imagine that your organization has addressed this kind of a challenge before, look to that and say, okay, so how did that problem get dealt with? Because um, sometimes people are leery of going down this road. So if you can say, well, look, in the, you know, two years ago, we had a similar example and here's how we addressed it. Uh, what do you think of that? Does that make sense? Could we build on that? Something like that. Or is there an external criteria that we could point to? like? an industry standard? Is there an object, you know, a standard out there that we could look at? Is there, you know, what does the law say? Is there a principle we could agree on? Things like that help to kind of get things unstuck so that you can generate ideas, okay? Now, before I keep going, by way of sort of summarizing the first two steps, I want to show you a video. Um, so it's a video of a guy named Seth Freeman, he's a friend of mine, teaches at NYU, teaches negotiation. And he's talking about, um, uh, he, he teaches negotiation in an MBA program and he's talking about one of his students. Most of his students are mid-career people. So he's talking about one of his students who is working and how basically he took the idea of interest and options and solved a difficult negotiation problem. So I want to show you this. The one thing um, that I want to just highlight before I do is a couple of things. So he starts out by talking about positions. You'll see him talking about that. He starts out, by the way, kind of rough. Like he, 
didn't give a whole lot of thought to the fact that he wanted to change the people's names that were involved to protect their anonymity. So he sort of does it on the fly. So it's a little painful at first, but um, he gets there. The other thing is he talks about the parable of the orange. Okay, so the parable of the orange, similar to the ugly orange exercise that you guys did in the book, Getting to Yes, um, I think I maybe mentioned this, but I'll just say it again. There are these two girls who are arguing over the orange, over an orange. And um, if they had talked about the, why they each needed the orange, one wanted the, the fruit to eat and one wanted the peel to bake a cake. If they had talked about that, they both would have gotten more for themselves, but they had to get to those underlying interests. So he refers to that in the talk. So it's about four or five minutes. Laura, when he starts to talk about the curve, um, we, can, um, we can stop it at that point, sort of after he shares the story, okay? So whenever you're ready, feel free to launch it. It is of essential importance to them. And let me give you one example why, and then relate it back to your work as a leader. I had a student who was sitting in his office one day, and he had an, an attack from a Godzilla. Or rather, not a Godzilla monster, but rather a Godzilla client. He got a call from his most important client of the firm, and she said, hi, Bob, hi, Steve. It's, it's Betty, and I wonder if you can tell us how the software program is going. And he says, great, we're just about to uh, complete it as on schedule in four weeks, as promised. And she said, yes, about that. We need it in two weeks. And he nearly fell off his chair and said, no, wait a minute. I, I, I doubt we can do that, Betty. And she said, well, could you do it? check for us, please, at least, because we really would love that, if you would. And so he said, all right, and checked with his engineers, and they laughed him out of the room. So he goes back and he calls her back and he says, Betty, I'm sorry, I just checked. And they said, there's absolutely really no way. And she said, well, all right, thanks at least for trying. And then 10 minutes later, he gets another call from his boss, get in here. And his boss is on a speakerphone call with Betty's boss, Brenda. And Brenda is reading the boss, the riot act, and saying, if you do not get us this software in two weeks, it will basically kill our relationship. And this was a kind of firm that this was their biggest client. They could actually turn the lights off of the software firm. And at this point, my student, Steve, wisely hit the mute button and told and said to the boss, tell her you'll call her back. And the boss, still flustered, said, can we call you back? And she said, yes, but I need to hear from you in 15 minutes. I'm going into a big meeting with my superiors. I got to have something from you. Great, we'll call you then. Great, bye get everyone in here. And now immediately all the engineers race in and it's a major meeting and it's very unhappy one. And it's, it's exactly getting into big trouble early because the engineers to a person say, we told Steve, we can't do this. We can't do this. It's impossible. And the boss said, no, 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 you don't understand. We've got to. Can't, got to, can't, got to. Sound familiar? They were taking positions. They were doing the parable of the orange. And Steve recognized it. And he said, no, wait a minute. Why can't we do this software in two weeks? And they reacted like, what, are you crazy? And they basically told him all the technical reasons. And then he said, OK, why do you suppose the client needs this in two weeks? And suddenly there was a silence, because they really hadn't thought about that. And like blind men touching the elephant, they all started to put their bits of knowledge about the client together, and they began to realize the client is trying to start a telephone marketing program, and the software is crucial, and they probably want to accelerate the debut of that campaign. Well, said Steve, is there any other way we can help them start this, pro this campaign on time without necessarily getting the software finished in time? And now they, don't, they start thinking, they hadn't really thought about that before, and they start kicking some ideas around. Time's up, only got a couple of minutes. So they call back Brenda, and they're all gathered around the desk, and with Steve's coaching, the boss says, Brenda, we think we, we, think we understand the situation, but be, we have an idea, but before we share it with you, we just want to understand better. Why do you need the software so soon? And it turns out they were exactly right, that telephone campaign. 
Well, again with the, Steve's coaching, the boss says, Brent, Brenda, if you need it in two weeks, I gotta tell you, there's no reputable software firm in America that could get it for you. But, if your goal is to get this campaign started in two weeks, well, did you know that some of the features that you'll need, in fact, all of the ones that you'll need, can be temporarily done manually, and we have some people here who know how to do that, and we can lend them to you as volunteers to serve you and do the manual work until the software is ready to take over. Would that be helpful? And Brenda said, you could do that for us? No problem at all. Thank you, said Brenda, this is great. This gives me something I can really give my bosses. You guys are great. You're gonna be hearing a lot from us. And the call ended happily. And they called back later and said, we, we may well take you up on this, but regardless, you, you guys are it. terrific. And we're gonna be giving you a lot more business. Okay, great. Uh, let me, so let me go back to sharing my screen. So, uh, everybody see that okay? Yeah, okay. So I think you saw there, in essence, like kind of the vast majority of what we just talked about. So the first thing, by the way, um, when they were all talking about this and Steve says, hit the mute button and tell her you'll call her back. He was going to the balcony, right? We talked about that last time, about stepping away. It gave them time to think, what do we do here? We don't have a lot of time, but at least it's some time to think. So the first thing was go to the balcony, like get out of the heat of the moment for a minute, pause, pull back, right? Second thing was their interest. Why did they need this, right? And they began to think, began to surmise, and um, realized they wanted to do this telephone marketing campaign, right? Um, which then led them to, okay, well, what options do we have? And again, initially they experienced, um, Essentially, people saying there, there are no options. We can't get this done in time. And then they started to think and they started to realize, wait a minute, we could manually enter the data um, until we get the software ready, right? That was an option that came up as part of a brainstorming process. So you see in many, in many ways, like in that four minutes, the essence of what we just talked about, okay? And that's how you do this because you're gonna come up against a lot of skepticism and questions when these things transpire, but that's the process in part that you want to follow. Now, there's one more step to go, but let me just pause and see if anybody's got any questions or comments about any of this. Let me grab the chat box here and just see, and you can, you can put uh, those questions in the chat box if you have them, <clears throat> or just unmute your line and ask. And if not, then I'll forge ahead. I just have a comment. I think okay. for me, the hardest part would be because um, I'm an emotional person, uh -huh. having that person to ground you in that video. He had someone who was like, okay, let's do this. You know, there was someone in charge. And I think for me as a leader, that would be the heart. You know, I would have to, um, you know, stop and wait before I react. Um, but then just going straight into that mentality, um, it's just would be a struggle. Um, yeah, would have to, it would be something I would have to practice. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know about anybody else, but I just I thought about that because I, I I find myself in that predicament quite a lot in my field, mm. um, where there's just you know clients are calling in and asking for things, and you're like, this is insane. What are they thinking? So it's good. It, it it's gonna um, make me think a little bit outside of the box now. Um, with that being an example. <laughs> Yeah, and, and again, don't be afraid to use the balcony, um, you know, to help you with that. And I think, you know, in your, in your line of work, I'm not sure what it is, but if you have the opportunity and you're not sure how to respond, you know, um, if you were to say to the person on the other line, you know what, let me think a little bit about, is it possible for you to say, let me think a little bit about what, you, what you're asking for, and can I give you a call back in, in a little bit? Um, is that possible? Yes, for me. Okay, yes. so I would urge you to do that because what I find in general is that when people feel like they have to say something in the moment and they, you know, their emotions are beginning to take them over, they usually um, regret what they said. It wasn't, if they had time to think about it, they would have said something different, right? So buy that time for yourself, 
usually it's there. Um, we put pressure on ourselves to, to provide an answer when in fact it may be possible to, to give a little bit of space and think about it. Because again, I mentioned in a previous um, moment that, that I typically will, um, I almost never say yes in the moment. I, usually I will step back and say, you know what, can I just think about this overnight and get back to you? Um, so, so that's one thing. Um, what if you're unable to buy extra time is the question. Um, I guess in part what I would say is that even if you were to give yourself a minute, okay, um, to contemplate, I'm going to guess that you can find a minute, even if it's on a phone call with say a client to say, or a customer or somebody to say, hang on one second and let me just give some thought to that. Um, I've never had somebody say, um, no, you're not allowed to think about what the answer should be, right? So, and sometimes that's all it takes is just to, to remove yourself so that you can feel the emotional element start to kind of, you, you're getting a handle on it. You're managing it in a way that's effective. And the more you do this, the less time you're going to need, the more comfortable you're going to feel thinking on your feet. Like I now even though I ask for that, if I need to, I feel very comfortable providing responses. Like I don't feel the pressure the way I used to. Um, and so the more you go, the more comfortable you're going to be and the less you're going to feel the need to buy time. Um, so good questions. And, you know, again, don't ignore the emotional piece. It's part of the deal. That's what makes negotiation difficult. Um, and so manage it, you know, think I, I can do this. Um, I just need to get my head around that. I need to just step to the balcony and get a coffee and think about where to go with this. Okay. So I know I've only got a, about 15 minutes, 13 minutes left to, to kind of get to the last piece here. So let me, let me move forward. Um, and again, I'm more than happy to give Laura my email to have her share my email. If there are questions after the fact that, that you have, um, happy to answer those. So in order to really, um, effectively negotiate, there's one more thing we have to do when it comes to this approach. And that's called understanding your BATNA or your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And really, all that you need to do to understand your BATNA um, is answer the question, what will I do if we can't reach agreement here? What happens then? Okay, what am I sort of walking away to? And if you don't think about your BATNA, if you don't contemplate it, then you don't really have a way of gauging this. this what's in front of you. So if, for example, somebody's made an offer to you, a lot of times people will say to me, did I get a good deal around X, Y, and Z? And I say, well, compared to what? Like you have to have some way to compare, you know, what that option or that offer is to, and that's where your BATNA comes in. Because let's just imagine, for example, if it's, you're trying to buy a car, okay? Well, um, if there's a particular offer that's on the table, if you look and you find five other scenarios where you found a car that's similar, similar year, and some are less, some are more, then you know that if you were to walk away from that negotiation, from buying that car, you could walk away to some of these others that would be acceptable to you. Okay, now you don't always have a great BATNA. When we use the term BATNA, um, it's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, okay, as, as has been put in your chat box there. And when we say best alternative, it doesn't mean it's good. It means it's the best of the bunch that you have, that you've thought about. And you want to maybe brainstorm that. So when you sit down and before you go into the negotiation, say, okay, if we can't reach agreement, what happens? What are the possibilities that I could do if, if we don't reach agreement? Is there another client I could engage with? Is there what? Right? So you've thought that through. Um, in a number of ways. So basically, in any negotiation, you get to a fork in the road, okay? And, and you do want to try to think about this initially, but there's going to become a, there's going to be usually a choice point in your negotiations. And when you hit that fork, if you go to the left, you are reaching an agreement around, you know, maybe one of the options you came up with in the last step. And if you go to the right, you're exercising your BATNA. You're saying, actually, um, what I could get away from the table is better than what's being offered. So I should exercise my BATNA and go that way. 
Now, when you do exercise your BATNA, if you decide to walk away from a deal or something like that, um, chances are that you will, uh, more often than not, you know, that will impact the relationship in some way, shape, or form. So you have to do it carefully. You have to think about, um, should I walk away here? And if, if so, why? Why is it important? But again, remember that the key here is that when we're in negotiation, remember back to the myths, your, your goal in negotiation is not to reach agreement. It's to meet your objective as best as possible. So if you get to a point in the negotiation and you say, okay, does this, if I reach this agreement with this person, does that meet my objective as best as possible? Or does, is my bat in a better? Right? And, and that's, that's the way you gauge things and figure out what you should do. Um, so just to be really clear, what a BATNA is and is not. So a BATNA is a backup plan, okay? It's not I'm going to offer $20,000 and I'm really willing to pay twenty five. dollars So it's a backup plan. It's if we can't reach agreement in this negotiation, what do I do then, right? It's, it's a bit of a benchmark. It's not a bottom line. You know, your bottom line could be um, if you were just, to think about it, say from a salary point of view, let's say that you have, you know, you calculated all your expenses and your life needs and it, it reached, you know, $50,000 a year. That's a bottom line based on the needs you have. A baton is more of a benchmark. It's more of, well, okay, so I know that if I were to walk away, this is what I'm walking away to. So anything better than that is what I should do, right? And the classic example would be if you had a job interview, right? And they offer you X dollars. Um, if you have no other job prospects lined up, you have a bad BATNA, um, which is essentially the unemployment line, right? So maybe you need to take that offer. Um, it's a little difficult to negotiate when you don't have a good BATNA. Um, but if you flip it around and let's say you line up, and this is the value of having more than one um, job offer at a time, of course, is that if you, you, know, you go to the first job offer and they offer you 50,000 and you go to the next job offer, and they offer you 40, well, you know your baton is 50 from the first negotiation, so you can negotiate a little more and see what you get. So it's a way of helping you in that regard. I get the question a lot, um, should I tell the other side about my baton? So my, the way that I use this is that I basically, first and foremost, it's really more about empowerment for me. It's, it's about the lay of the land and understanding what the deal is from a negotiation point of view for me. So if I have a good BATNA, that means I don't need this agreement so badly. I'm walking away to something that's, uh, that's okay, right? Um, and so I don't use it. Some people do use their BATNAs and hit the other person over the head with them um, and basically say, well, there's 12 clients, and if you can't do it, we'll just go there, right? That's, that, that happens. So when I do share my BATNA, when I feel the need to, and, and I usually will share my BATNA mostly when I'm dealing with somebody who's intransigent or really difficult. And I will basically say to them, look, just so you know, there are some things that, that we can do if this doesn't work out. Um, my preference, and this is typically how I say it, my preference is that we work out an agreement, that we work out some kind of deal um, that works for both of us. But, but you need to understand that I'm, I'm not willing to just do anything. And there are some things that we can do if we can't reach agreement. Um, and so I really try to convey that as a, a as a warning, not a threat, right? And the difference, so my colleague Roger Fisher, one of the other authors of Getting to Yes, used to say the difference between a warning and a threat is when you say to your son, Johnny, a warning is if you say to your son, Johnny, you go out in the street, you're gonna get hit by a car. <clears throat> a threat is, Johnny, if you go out in the street, I'll hit you with my car, okay? Comes across a lot differently um, in that scenario, right? So how do you determine your bat? And I know I got a few more minutes here. Basically, again, the key question here is, what will happen if, if I or we can't reach agreement with the other party? All right, that, you ask that question and then there's the answer, right? But then you may have a number of alternatives. You might be able to go to court, you might be able to whatever, you know, there could be a number of alternatives. So think about the different ones that you might have and then what's the best of the bunch and what are the consequences of actually putting it into practice? As I mentioned, you know, one consequence is that you might damage the relationship. Are you okay with that? Is how important is the relationship, et cetera? And usually what we do when it comes to BATNAs is that, especially if we're in a weaker power position, is that we tend to underestimate our BATNA and overestimate the BATNA of the other. So be careful um, about that because 
Um, sometimes this can become debilitating and you don't want it to be debilitating. You want it to help you think through what you're doing, right? Um, let me give you one quick example. Um, and, and by the way, I should say that as much as it's really important for you to think through your bat, it's also really important to think through the batna of the other side, okay? Because if they don't have a good batna, that helps you, right? If you know that they need to reach an agreement, then, okay, well, you, you know, maybe you, you can sort of nudge things along in a way that would be helpful for you. But let me, let me kind of close with a, an example of how you can actually take a bad batna and turn it into something positive and how that impacts negotiation. So one of the cases in the book uh, that I've mentioned uh, was from a colleague of mine. And, and basically, he got a call from a company that um, it, it's an Australian company that works primarily in China and does business in China. And this company had to purchase a big piece of machinery. They had um, a piece of that machinery, but it was 10 years old and they desperately needed a new one. It wasn't keeping up with their business demands and things like that. And so, and they had to buy it in, from a company in China due to regulations in China. And so they went to the, the company that they had bought this for before, from before, and they said, okay, we need to buy a new one. And basically the Chinese company knew that they were the sole supplier of this machinery in China. And so they said, okay, it's gonna cost you 10 times what you paid last time. And they were like, uh, no, like we can't, we'll go out of business if we pay that. And the Chinese company said, we don't believe you. We think your bottom line is better than that. So too bad, like figure it out. So these guys were like, um, what are we gonna do now? So they called my friend and they said, we need your help. Like we don't, we can't agree to this, but we have to buy something there. Like we don't have any choice. So what do we do? So he listened to them when they talked about it and he said, okay, here's what I want you to do. And I'm gonna give you three days to do it. He said, I want you to assume that that company has gone out of business, that you're gonna buy this equipment from, has gone out of business. How will you still meet your interests for that machinery? And they looked at him, they're like, are you nuts? Like we already have um, a difficult problem on our hands and now you wanna make it worse? He's like, sorry, that's my advice. You have three days, I'll be back. And they were like, holy crap, what are we gonna do? So they started to think, they started to brainstorm and try to come up with ideas. And they came up with a few and none of them seemed to be so great until one of the employees said, I wonder if there's another company in China that owns this equipment and maybe isn't using it or would be willing to sell it. And they said, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess we better see what we can find. And so they sent one of the employees off to try to research um, this. And what he found was there was a company in one of the provinces and he reached out to them and it turned out that they had changed their business about two years ago and they had this equipment and they weren't using it. And as a result, they would, they would like to sell it because it was a burden for them. So my friend comes back, they say, hey, great news, we found this equipment. Um, it's used, but serviceable, et cetera. And he said, great, that's what you need. So they went back to the company in China and they said, look, uh, we can't pay the 10, you know, the tenfold increase. Um, and you know, this is what we can do. And we really need you to be more reasonable about this. And they said, no. And they said, well, we just want you to know that we do have an alternative that we found somebody who has used equipment and they're willing to sell it to us. And if we need to go down that road, we will. You know, our preference is to buy a new equipment and have a service contract with you and yada, yada, yada. And the Chinese company is like, well, let us look into it. And they said, have, go for it. And they did. And they said, okay, that's legitimate. And so they were able to negotiate something far less onerous for them. So that's how they took a really bad BATNA. Usually you don't have a great one when you're dealing with a sole supplier and kind of turned it on its head and, and found a way to change the circumstances. And so that's in part how you can use a BATNA to sort of help you with all of this, okay? So quick summary, because I know I have a minute left. Um, basically, um, here's where we went. Um, we talked a little bit about challenging some commonly held beliefs about negotiation and myths, um, understanding some barriers to success and what do you do with those things. Um, managing the emotional side of negotiation, which we've been talking about, and the idea of going to the balcony. And then talking a little bit about the two models of negotiation and when you would use each and, and why and how. So some next steps for you. So I, I think Laura mentioned in the first class that we have developed an arrangement with uh, LPV that 
um, that if you are interested in getting a master's degree, we can forgive two courses because of what you've done here. Uh, and, and so you, there, you'd have to take 10 classes and you're happy, we're, we're more than happy to chat with you about that if you're interested and wanting to know more and do more of a deep dive in all of this. Um, there's a ton of negotiation resources out there. Um, I um, did a, a, a audiobook series a few years ago with the BBC called The Negotiator and You um, that are out there and probably can be downloaded for pennies on the dollar, I guess, at this point. <laughs> Not exactly the most lucrative thing, but that's fine. Um, there's also a book um, called The Negotiator and You in paperback um, that was put out by um, a publishing company in Amherst. So anyways, it, it's a, a little bit more, but there's plenty of books out there that if you're interested, um, you, you know, it's worth exploring and, and looking into that. And I mentioned this before, but I'll just say it again. Practice makes perfect here. Um, this is gonna feel strange. It will be different than what you've done, but it will become second nature very quickly if you use it. And so, you know, you're gonna make mistakes, accept that, acknowledge that, embrace it. Um, it will get better. You will, uh, you know, especially when you put in the time to prepare, as we've talked a little bit about. And then one thing that's very helpful um, is to find sort of a negotiation colleague or somebody that you can bounce ideas off of that's not involved in the specific negotiation you're dealing with. So, um, you know, explaining almost what you did in, in your breakout, just sort of explaining to them what the situation is and saying, can you help me think this through a little bit. Um, that can be a really helpful way to prepare for a negotiation situation. So I just want to thank you. I appreciate, I know um, Zooming is um, enabling us to do lots of things and yet it can also um, wear us down over time. Um, the Zoom fatigue I think is real. Um, so I appreciate you all staying with me. I hope this has been helpful for you. And again, happy to answer any questions. Laura can share my email uh, with all of you. And um, I just want to wish you the best of luck in, in the rest of what you're doing and, and going forward. You know, we need leaders now more, more than ever. And so please be there, be them. Um, don't wait for somebody to ask you, step into that role. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to Josh and for his willingness to, to break this up into a smaller session so we didn't have to sit um, all day. Because <laughs> yeah, the Zoom fatigue is definitely a real thing. Um, Josh did mention that uh, the Bay Path program, so we'll share information about that. Um, he did not mention, but I know he has a podcast series, so we can share uh, his website with some of those podcasts. Um, and as I was listening to him, there, there were just some, some themes that come through with things that we've been doing all year together. So, you know, the idea of resilience and being persistent. Um, being creative, uh, how that creativity really comes into negotiations. We don't think of creativity going along with negotiations, but getting to a solution together takes that creativity, listening, um, the emotional intelligence, which has been woven throughout this program. Um, you know, I appreciate the, was, was it Sandra that asked, well, what if you don't have a little bit of time and just being able to take that moment to breathe and step yourself back and, and also just noticing what, you know, as your, your heart is racing, all of those things so that, so that you can give yourself that time and understanding how you're reacting um, because we're all emotional beings. Uh, the humility part I thought was really good and uh, the idea of plussing. So some of the things uh, we've, we've talked about, even when we went back to the vision session and how we were talking about building um, from ideas with each other. So that is everything for this morning. This afternoon, we'll be back together. Um, you'll have a chance to talk about your projects and then also about your own personal leadership plans as we wrap up our time together. Um, and then uh, we'll have a just brief what I know about how we're going to do graduation, which I'm really excited about. So we will see you guys back at 1.30. Any questions as we leave? Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Josh. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Welcome. Thanks, Josh. Welcome.